Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and I'm a little intimidating in such a intimidated in such a crowd of notables here. Um, the this is a big topic um, that we're talking about. Uh, the the on the itinerary that the topic was um, standard therapies for myeloma. Um, the role of autologous transplant and maintenance therapy. Um, it's a very familiar topic though, because we this is um, something that we're dealing with routinely when we see new transplant patients, uh, I'm sorry, new myeloma patients and considering uh, folks for, for bone marrow transplant. Just a little background on myself. Um, I am at the University of New Mexico, a, a NCI cancer center. And prior to this, I was um, at, in Seattle for 22 years, um, where one of our one, one of the other speakers, Dr. Ed Libby and Andrew Cowan, are, are, are located. Uh, so I have a lot of experience with stem cell transplant, both with autologous transplant, which is typical for, for multiple myeloma, and for allogeneic transplants. Uh, here in, at UNM, though, I see a lot of myeloma patients, and, and um, transplant uh, myeloma is the number one diagnosis for transplant. So we had a very nice introduction to the history of myeloma. I'm going to kind of uh, build on that a little bit. And just as a reminder, you know, um, multiple myeloma is a disease of plasma cells. And we, we saw the, uh, some of the history of that very nicely. Plasma cells are, um, are activated B lymphocytes that ordinarily live in the bone marrow and secrete these antibodies. That's what's kind of shown on the right, a bone with the marrow on the inside. And when uh, you acquire a series of gene mutations in a single plasma cell, uh, it starts to grow. So because it came from one cell, that's called a clone. And that clone of cells makes a single antibody that's a monoclonal antibody. And so that's a very convenient test in the blood where we can monitor the progress of the disease. Over on the left is just kind of a schematic of all the other cells that grow in the bone marrow space too. And that's important because some of our treatments like, um, high dose melphalan therapy and stem cell transplant, it kind of wipes out all of those cells. They're all very sensitive to that drug. And so we have to, have to manage that and have a solution. So um, when we see a, a myeloma patient, our first question always is, is this the proper diagnosis? You know, the diagnosis means, you know, what is, the, what is it you're dealing with exactly? And the finding of the plasma cells in the myeloma uh, increased is, a key uh, finding, but there are a lot of actually sophisticated genetic tests that, that are done as well. And um, it's called multiple myeloma when it is advanced to the point where it's symptomatic. Uh, if, it's at a, a, if it's at an earlier stage, um, it might be a slower process like smoldering myeloma or monoclonal gammopathy that can be monitored and doesn't need therapy. The next question we ask is where is it at uh, and, uh, and how extensive is it? So finding out where it's at, it often requires imaging. And since, since myeloma causes holes in the bone, you can see that on x-rays. But MRI and PET CTs are very useful as well as kind of getting an, an idea of the extent. Um, the, those serum proteins or those proteins that the myeloma makes in the blood and in the urine are very helpful. They don't tell you how much disease there is, but they're very useful at telling the relative change in how much there is in the individual patient over time. So you sort of have to calibrate um, your imaging and your assessments of how much disease there is to a, per a particular patient's myeloma protein level in the blood and urine, and then you can follow that change over time to know if they're responding or if their disease is coming back. Um, and then finally, the consequences of those extra plasma cells in the bone marrow is, you know, is some significant um, uh, symptoms, and that can be the holes in the bones themselves make them fragile and, and cause fractures, even with very minimal trauma or no trauma at all. They can fill up the bone marrow space, uh, and so it can start to um, interfere with normal blood cell production, both the red blood cells, which carry oxygen, and the white blood cells that fight infection, and the platelets, which are important for uh, to, to stop bleeding. And then finally, that, that protein that the myeloma makes uh, can get to the point in the blood where it starts to gum up the kidneys and can actually cause the kidneys to completely fail. And so one of the major goals of myeloma treatment is to prevent all of these complications as well as improving the quality of life of the patient and their life expectancy. So those are some basics. I thought I'm gonna talk about standard therapy. I better talk about some of the basics. 
of what myeloma is and, and what the treatments are. And these goals, uh, you know, is the next objective to figure out what can we, what can we do about it. And the, the, for a patient who has a lot of um, immediate problems, our first goal is to really try to relieve those as quickly as possible. <clears throat> if their kidney function is not good, if they have impending fractures or something. And then um, with our systemic therapies, um, the, um, the goal is to get the disease into remission and postpone the recurrence of those problems as long as possible. Finally, of course, we would like to improve the life expectancy and quality of life of the patients. And compared to um, where things were uh, 20 years ago, even when I started my, my uh, career in cancer medicine, things are, uh, you know, the life expectancy of patients are three or four times longer than they used to be. What's most elusive, of course, is curing the disease. And um, I, you know, I think we are hopeful uh, in myeloma because we've had such huge strides in improving the overall life expectancy. Um, but I think it may take some fundamental new approaches uh, and new types of therapies that, that may be coming in the future. Um, so um, this slide, I'm sorry, it doesn't quite fit on my screen. Uh, is meant to show the timeline of therapies and it's kind of color coded to the class of therapies. The earlier uh, treatments that Dr. Bergseigel mentioned was these alkylating chemotherapy agents that actually go in, damage the genetic material of DNAs and induce a self-destruct mechanism. But it's pretty nonspecific because any cell that's, that's growing and dividing in the body will have that same kind of effect. Um, however, it was, you know, found to be effective. And when done at high dose, high doses, it's even more effective. And that's basically the basis of a, an autologous stem cell transplant. Early on, transplants were done using the bone marrow of the, of the patient, which is very, you know, a lot of morbidity to go and have that harvested, especially if you're sick and have brittle bones. But later we learned that we can harvest stem cells from the peripheral blood after um, giving the patient a, a growth factor shot, it turns out not only do the white blood cells increase, but stem cells go into the circulation and we can collect them that way. And then of course, uh, uh, around the year 2000, um, there was just a, a whole series of um, remarkable innovations in um, myeloma therapy with the development of the thalamids as we heard and the proteasome inhibitors both of these um, interfere with protein turnover in the cells and, inter and, and um, alter the signaling pathways. And then finally, um, there's a, a series of immune therapies, which we'll, we'll probably hear about later today, um, that include antibody therapies, antibodies conjugated to toxins, and finally, antibody um, genes fuse to T cell receptors <laughs> in a modified T lymphocyte. So it's a, a, a cell, cellular based immune therapy. And then a recent uh, medication that's come out is, a, uh, is, is exciting because it functions by a different mechanism, and that is selenuxor, and it, it interferes with protein nuclear export. Uh, uh, the reason why it's exciting that something has a new mechanism is that sometimes the, the resistance that we see to one drug um, carries over and also confers resistance to other drugs. So it's nice to have a medicine that works by a different mechanism. Uh, so for example, um, the, the uh, alkylating agents work by a different mechanism than these um, uh, proteins, uh, these drugs involved with protein turnover. And so transplant is often beneficial even if these other therapies aren't working and vice versa. So um, this is the same thing kind of listed in, um, in kind of a list format the different classes of medicines and just naming them. So you probably uh, folks have seen um, many or all of these medications and their therapies. And as you can see, there are several drugs in the image class of medicines, uh, the proteasome inhibitors. And they're, they're, they're the, if one drug stops working, you sometimes can get benefit from the other one, but oftentimes it's not as long lived. So it is nice to have treatments that work by different mechanisms. So uh, the, one of the topics uh, was what is standard therapy for myeloma? And um, that's a little bit difficult to say because there we're, we're, there's a larger and larger smorgasbord of options for myeloma therapy. But in the US, it's uh, pretty standard um, uh, in the majority of patients to use a triple therapy for um, 
for the initial treatment of myeloma patients. And a common regimen, which I'll show you a little bit more information about, is the combination of Velcade, Relamin, and Dexamethasone, or we might call that VRD. And, uh, but there are other triple combinations. And um, most of these have the same similar classes of medicines in them. So they're slightly just different flavors of the same thing. Um, uh, the, the cyborg is slightly different because there's an alkylating agent in this one. After the initial um, treatment period, if, if the disease ha has achieved a good response, then you may um, decrease the level of therapy and do what we call maintenance therapy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of these treatments and what we know and what we don't really know. One of the things that we first think about when, when we're considering treatment also, though, is how sick is the patient and how able are they to withstand these treatments? Um, you know, pa patients can get myeloma at all different ages and, and they can have all different kinds of health status. One consideration that we think about is, is this, are we thinking that this person might um, benefit from a, from a transplant later on? And, or, or uh, are we thinking that they're not interested or it wouldn't really be suitable? And actually you may have more treatment options if you're not a transplant candidate because some of these medicines um, reduce your ability to collect stem cells and you may not wanna do them as long or upfront if you are thinking of doing a transplant. On the other hand, if you're not very fit, then doing many drugs all at the same time may also be too toxic as Dr. Bergsagel mentioned. This is actually um, a real data from a, a, a study um, comparing the combination of two drugs, uh, Velcade and dexamethasone versus three drugs, Velcade, Revlimid and dexamethasone. And the, this primary endpoint was just how many people uh, disease responded. And the definitions of the response, so you have to kind of set some kind of um, you know, criteria for putting them into categories. So the, uh, the PR or partial response is if the markers in the blood and urine went down by um, more than 50%, so there was only 10 to 50% of what you started with. And this is how many people um, achieved a partial response. Uh, there was also um, some patients who had over 90% of their um, markers go down. So there was less than 10% of what they started with. And that's here, the very good partial response. And then, you know, the, um, the, uh, holy grail is to get a complete response where all the markers are completely um, not detectable. And uh, that's what's seen at the bottom. But if you add all of this up, patients who had at least a 50% reduction with the triple drug regimen, you see over 80% of patients have achieved at least a 50% reduction in the, in, the, um, in the burden of disease. And uh, uh, about 16% uh, percent of patients or more have had um, a complete response where it's actually not detectable at all. So, um, you know, all of this is really just uh, uh, numbers on paper. What does that really mean for translating to how somebody's doing? Well, it turns out that those responses really do have a significant impact on, um, on the experience the patient has. On the left is how long the disease is in remission according to which category of response you saw in the patients. So the patients whose disease kind of stayed the same, didn't go down by 50%, you can see that it was, it was a much shorter time, less than two years before their disease started progressing again. On the other hand, if you had more than 90% reduction, a very good partial response or complete response where you can't see it at all, these folks uh, went um, about four years before you saw their disease progress again. The same kind of thing actually was seen with the life expectancy of the patients. That's shown over here. Everything shifted to the right, but you can see that the, the, the disease getting in remission was a predictor for how long somebody lived as well. Now, one of the, the concepts I think it's important to understand that we some even physicians sometimes forget is that um, what this largely represents is the var variations in the, to, in the biology of individual patients' disease. So some folks just have more gene mutations or they have gene mutations in the myeloma that makes it harder to treat. And this difference in response isn't so much having to do necessarily on how long you did the therapy or the combination, particular combination you chose. It's just some disease is slower growing or some disease just melts away much easier um, in some patients versus others. It's still important to know, uh, uh, but it's, um, 
it's not necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily guide you too much in your treatment. So uh, a question that comes up a lot then in, um, in myeloma therapy is, should you be adding drugs together and doing them in combination or should you be doing, should you separate them and do them separately? Uh, and I think, you know, what with the benefits of doing them in combination is that if you do more at once, you're likely to have more of a response. Uh, if you have get it down into a, a deeper remission, the remission duration will be longer as well. However, you're going to have more side effects because all those drugs all at once, you're going to have more side effects. And that's why it's appropriate if you're not too concerned about the disease or you think someone may not handle uh, too many things all at once, you can, you can do things sequentially and you may get just as much benefit from it doing it that way. Uh, in the end, we're not, we don't know too much about uh, the, the differences uh, in overall benefit from combining things or doing them sequentially. Oftentimes what we see, uh, studies aren't designed this way. They just, they look at a combined therapy versus a solo therapy, which is not a really fair comparison because, you know, you wouldn't, you know, wouldn't normally do that. You would normally want to know if you, if it's better to do them together or to do them separate. Um, so, um, we, uh, we sh I think we should uh, take it a little bit with a grain of salt about getting too ambitious and, and having that 20 drug <laughs> regimen that we mentioned before, that Dr. Bergsable mentioned, the side effect profile would probably, um, and expense would probably not warrant it. So what about stem cell transplant? Stem cell transplant is a way to just give more melphalan chemotherapy. The oldest drug we have in myeloma is, is most effective if it's given in a high dose. But if it's given in a high dose, it knocks out the normal blood uh, uh, cells as well. And a way around that is just to get the bone marrow from a patient and give it back to them after the chemotherapy. So we do this from the peripheral blood as shown down here on the left using an apheresis machine. So it's a pretty benign procedure, much more benign than, than if you harvest it from the bone marrow in the, in the old days. Um, just for completion's sake, I'm showing that, that stem cells can be obtained from umbilical cord blood as well. That's called, that would be appropriate for a donor transplant or allogeneic, and I won't be talking about that right now. So collection of stem cells, you, to, in order to get enough stem cells in the blood, you have to give a growth factor shot for uh, about four days, and then you can go into an apheresis machine like I showed. And sometimes that'll get you enough uh, stem cells in the blood where you can get enough uh, for one or two transplants. But oftentimes we add this extra medicine, plerixophor, which pushes even more uh, stem cells out into the blood. When you give uh, the treatment, it's really just a single day, a single dose of melphalan that takes an hour or two to infuse. And then you have all the consequences to deal with because it's given in a high dose. The drug's out of your system a couple days later. So we infuse the stem cells back in just like a blood transfusion. And over the course of the next week, we see the blood counts go down. And then about two weeks later, we see them rebound and come back up again. But there's a lot of other side effects that go along with that. So for example, you're the next most sensitive organ is the GI tract. So patients really struggle with anorexia, diarrhea, nausea, and need a lot of supportive care during that time period. And because of that, the treatment isn't necessarily appropriate for everybody. Uh, you have to be pretty fit to be able to do it. And, um, and so that's a careful conversation we need to have with all patients who might be interested. So is it, is it right for you? I, I think the things to think about um, are, are your age. There's not a hard cutoff at age 70, but uh, I, we're often reducing the dose of the drugs because it's the side effects are harder to deal with and then you might not get as much benefit from it. If you're over age 80, I think it's, it's generally not even uh, worthwhile considering. And in your 70s, um, I think if you're on the lower end of that and you're super fit, it may be more appropriate. You know, if you're 40 years old and you have myeloma, then the chances are you're gonna run out of treatment options. So I would definitely recommend it in younger patients because you really should take advantage of everything that's out there. The other question is how fit are you? I ask my patients, are they able to walk a mile a day? Not necessarily in one you know, straight stretch, but it's just a general, it's a pretty good indicator of whether um, your medical condition or, or the myeloma itself has, has made you too sick to be able to really withstand that. And the other, the other aspect of that is if you're not in good shape, it takes longer to rebound. So, so you're, you're more likely to get benefit and, and get back to your normal lifestyle quicker if you're in better shape. Is the disease in remission? Well, um, 
the, uh, it's best to, to do a transplant when the disease is under good control because um, you'll get a longer duration of benefit, but also it's hard to do intensive therapies afterwards. So you wanna have a, a, a time period where you don't have to do very intensive treatment after a transplant. There's a big time commitment. Um, it, it, you shouldn't have other serious health problems. And then you have to think about the side effects that we talked about. The benefit, uh, it doesn't cure the disease. It, um, on, the, on the median uh, time of, of, of um, remission is about three years. If you go into transplant with the disease under good control, if it's not under good control, then it's gonna be less than that. The overall impact on, on survival is pretty minimal as we saw, but randomized studies, old randomized studies showed zero to one year of improved overall survival in uh, transplant patients. It's relatively cost effective when you think of the outrageous costs of other myeloma therapies. So it makes sense uh, to do um, cost-effective therapies up front. And it's a different mechanism, as I said, the alkylating agents versus the, the other um, uh, sort of newer uh, treatments. The complication rate nowadays is pretty low because we, we know how to support these patients and, and to select patients who are reasonably healthy. Uh, but infections are the biggest risk that can happen when the blood counts are low. And GI side effects uh, add to that uh, infection risk and also are you know, add to the morbidity and, and the, the, the discomfort of patients. So what about Revlimid maintenance? Um, I think I'm going, to, I'm going a little bit late here, so I'll try to, to be brief. Um, the, uh, uh, or maintenance therapy is when you do a single drug or a drugs at a reduced dose after getting a disease in remission with the idea of um, trying to uh, improve the overall um, benefit to the patient. There have been a, 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 a variety of randomized studies looking at um, maintenance therapy, and this is one looking at Revlimid maintenance. Um, and on the left, you see the duration of time that people's disease stayed in remission if they uh, took low-dose Revlimid as maintenance after their primary induction therapy. So you can see they stayed in remission longer. Um, it, well, on the right, what you see is that the impact on the survival, the, the life expectancy of the patient with the Revlimid maintenance was pretty minimal. And so you could, you could argue um, uh, what the benefit of this is. This is mostly a number on paper. You know, your markers on, on, the, on your lab results are, are look better longer. Uh, you, if, you, if you see the progression, you probably have to go back on therapy. But uh, if, you, if you were um, not on Revlimid maintenance, whereas if you're on Revlimid maintenance, you may not have to go on to uh, such an intensive therapy as long. Uh, so whether that's worth it, I think is arguable. Uh, it's harder to make the argument that you're going to live longer and that it should be strongly recommended. However, it is often a standard and, and it is uh, the same kind of benefit with, with progression-free survival or this time that your intermission is seen after transplant uh, as well as after other induction therapies. So this is kind of the, uh, this is the kind of the dilemma. Uh, do you do a maintenance therapy? Uh, uh, it, it, do you do an induction therapy and then a maintenance? And the clinical trials often compare these two things, but, but why is it that you don't actually live longer? If it keeps your disease in remission longer, then why wouldn't the life expectancy be longer? And the simple reason is that in reality, this is not what happens. Uh, the people who were not on maintenance therapy, they, um, they got their induction, they did not get maintenance, but when their disease came back, then they could get the Revlimid off study. So it's, it's, it's not that you can't get the drug, it's the question more is the timing of the drug. And it turns out that you may get just as much benefit by doing that um, maintenance drug at a later time versus if you did it at an earlier time. And so the question that we often don't address in our clinical trials is the timing and sequencing of drugs as opposed to whether or not the drug has some kind of benefit. That's my last slide. I hope I didn't go over time too much. I, I'm hope, I hope that the, um, we address kind of the concepts here as well as some of the details. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know it's fantastic. So thank you so much. That's a lot to cover in a very <laughs> period of time. And I think for newly diagnosed patients, um, it's okay if you feel overwhelmed with all the content that you're gonna be seeing today. It's like a fire hose. And it really takes some time to kind of get used to what are the drug classes. And you did a really nice job going through the different drug classes and transplant. And I like how you um, focused on just stay fit, no matter what stage of myeloma you have. I know some patients have more bone damage than others, but 
stay as fit as you possibly can because it opens up opportunities for you. Thank you.